up Malaysia City volunteers tend to students and teachers of a bus accident in Kuala Lumpur. In Taiwan, we see how a good disaster prevention plan helped save the lives of those in Pingdong's Jiamu village. Welcome to Dar Headlines, I'm Wendy Chen, thank you for joining us. We kick off today's show in Malaysia's Kuala Lumpur, where a bus accident near Hulu Lung Gate left one student dead and several others injured. Upon hearing the news, CG volunteers quickly mobilized to provide comfort and support to the terrified students and their parents. In Malaysia's Kuala Lumpur, a school excursion turned tragic on March 24th when the bus carrying 36 students and teachers overturned on its way to Hulu Langit, leaving one student dead and several injured. Three students were sent here to our hospital. One is now in stable condition, but the other one unfortunately passed away. Following the accident, worried parents rushed to the hospitals to which their children were sent. 17-year-old Lian San Yi was among the passengers that suffered injuries. It all happened real quick. A minute before the accident, I woke up and I felt a sudden break before the bus overturned and everyone started screaming. Following the news that the teachers and students were sent to Ambang Hospital and Sedan Hospital, volunteers quickly mobilized to provide care and comfort for the students and their parents. Seeing how everything is in a mess, we spoke to each student to learn of their situation. If they needed x-rays, we accompanied them. Having experienced the impermanence of life, the students now cherish every moment they have with their loved ones. In China, Sutan City volunteers recently visited 42-year-old care recipient Cao Ben Chong and her mother. As part of their continuous care for the family, this time around volunteers bought daily necessities and helped clean up their homes. Let's take a look. Here in Sichuan's Luoshui, Siji volunteers once again are visiting Siji care recipient Cao Benchong and her mother, who live in this ramshackle house. Due to the misuse of medication when young, 42-year-old Cao Benchong is now unable to look after herself and being taken care of by her 80-year-old mother. Thankfully, city volunteers are also there to lend a helping hand. <laughs> Seeing their lives, we feel that we are so blessed, we're healthy and able. On the contrary, she is not able to look after herself. What Master Zheng Yan says is so true, which is seize the opportunity to do good deeds or fulfill filial duties before it is too late. City volunteers then give Cao's house a thorough cleaning. They install a water pipe for the family's access to tap water and provide them a washing machine. Later, the volunteers clean up the home inside and out and bring new back wheels and mosquito nets for them to use. Next, the volunteers help the family do the dishes and also bring new kitchenware and utensils. Seeing the change of her house, Cao's mother is moved and grateful to city volunteers' assistance. Last year, you gave us subsidies and I bought medicine for her. After taking the medicine, she has improved and now she can put on her pants and shoes by herself. I don't need to do that for her now. The city volunteers have been really kind to us. Thank you very much. Thanks to the volunteers' long-term assistance, Cao Ben Chong and her mother find their lives vastly improved. Moving to Taiwan, this year marks the 10th year of Taipei's Muzha Recycling Station. The recycling volunteers, they are mostly seniors, with some over 70 and others over 80. Despite their age, all are still very energetic and see the tax of sorting recyclables as a blessing. Ah. 
Six days a week, Zhou Ying, who is 85, takes a bus each morning at 6 in order to start her day at the Cijin Muzha recycling station. I enjoy coming here to sort recyclables. My days go by a lot faster. Cijin is doing a great job at it. That's why I've been coming here for many years. I'll continue on until I can no longer. In the 10 years since its establishment, Cijin Muzha recycling station, has had many capable volunteers come through its doors, like Chen Wu Chen, who has been recycling for the past 28 years. I started doing recycling at the age of 16. I'm 88 this year. I was practicing recycling when no one was doing it. I did it on my own. I collect recyclables and then give them to the chapter. With determination to keep the planet clean, many of these seniors find it to be a blessing to join in this daily activity. Look at how rough my hands are. They are all calloused. Harry? No, I do a half day here and in the afternoon, I have my work in the mountains. I'm filled with Dharma joy because this is good for our planet. Not letting their age get in the way of sorting recyclables, these seniors continue to set an example for the rest to follow. In Hualien, Taiwan, staff members of the Tzuji Foundation recently conducted home visitations to impoverished families in Guangfu Township. During their visits, they discovered a resident over 60 years of age who is a stroke victim. As the family is already struggling to make ends meet, the monthly fee of renting an electronic bed was even a greater burden for the wife to shoulder. It was then that Tzuji decided to donate a second-hand electronic bed to help this family. Working together, a group of city volunteers moved and set up an electronic bed in Mrs. Lee's home. Seeing her dreams fulfilled, Mrs. Lee is moved. I asked if she had any unused patient beds. She said there should be one available and she will go take a look. Then later the volunteer came back with the bed for us free of charge. I really want to thank you. Mrs. Lee's husband suffered a stroke two years ago and the family had to rent the patient bed. The monthly fee incurred is a burden on this economically challenged family. Thus solving their problem, volunteers can feel Mrs. Lee's trouble has lifted. She needs to take care of her husband and two grandchildren. We will continue to follow up on the caring for this family. With Ciji by their side, Mrs. Lee is given the strength to be the strong pillar of support for her family. Here in Taiwan, typhoons are a fact of life for most of the island. However, it was not until 2009, facing the devastation brought by Typhoon Marakot, that mountain communities became proactive in the implementation of disaster prevention plans. One of the pioneers of this movement has been Ke Wulang, the former chief of Jamu village in Pingdong's Wutai township. Thanks to his planning before and during the typhoon, despite his village being in the midst of the disaster zone, not not one life was lost. Let's take a look at how he did it. In 2009, Typhoon Morocot swept through central and southern Taiwan, leaving over 500 people dead or missing. However, one village in Pingdong's Wutai Township, despite being in the middle of the disaster zone, escaped without harm. The reason was this man. Rock and mudslides are really dangerous. You need to have some contingency measures against them, otherwise they can devastate a community. Under the guidance of Ke Wulang, dietary reporters returned to Jamu village to revisit those harrowing days during and following Typhoon Marakot. Although it has now been five years since Marakot hit Taiwan, its power is still evident here in the mountains of southern Taiwan. The scars of past rock slides are everywhere, and even today the repair of roads damaged in the typhoon continues. With roads still down, now the only access to the village is over this riverbed. 
Looking up from the valley that houses Jammu village, what comes into the eyes is the area that was once a holiday villa before it was swept away. Today, there are only 30 households still living here in Jammu. Over half of the village chose to move to Baihe village in Tangzi Township, hoping to put the nightmare bought by Marakart behind them. The rain was too big. It was almost like an earthquake. We heard reports of villages being washed away. Surprisingly, our entire village made it through safely. During Marakats, the only road leading to Jammu village was washed away, putting the lives of the 100 plus villagers in great danger. Fortunately, Ke Wulang had prepared contingency plans, including dividing responsibilities among villagers. The first group was the command group, the second group was in charge of cooking and food, which was really important. Ke also puts all the vehicles and resources of the village under centralized control, in addition to creating two emergency shelters and a helicopter landing point. Every few hours, he would measure the cracks in the earth to stay on top of possible landslides. We stuck a bamboo in here. Every two hours, I would send someone to check on it. That way we could tell if the ground was sinking or not. While keeping on top of the situation, Ke also called on anyone that had previous training in disaster prevention to return and help. There are some young people from our village that were a part of the rescue teams during the AA floods, so there was a possibility that they could use a helicopter to fly in to help. Thanks to such meticulous planning and organization, the villages of Jammu stayed safe. For governments and similar communities, it was also a wake-up call on the importance of having preventive or response measures in place when a disaster strikes. Staying in Taiwan, since last year the government of New Taipei City has been promoting the installation of solar power panels in various schools and communities. Next, we take a look at the benefits of installing these solar panels. Buildings integrated with solar panels on roofs, this is the first solar power community in New Taipei City, Taiwan. We want to encourage private property owners to install solar power panels, so we decided to offer them subsidies. Besides producing nearly 56,000 watts of energy per year, the solar panels also decrease room temperatures inside the building. Furthermore, they act as a layer of protection, preventing excessive rainwater from seeping through rooftops. I felt that it would be good for us if we installed solar panels on the roof. It has decreased temperatures inside anywhere from 3 to 5 degrees. If every family installed solar panels, we would not need to build another nuclear power plant because we would have enough energy to use. Currently, 11 households in this community have solar power panels installed. To protect our Mother Earth, these residents hope our government can contribute their share and encourage more citizens to join them in their efforts. Conducting classes on the roof at their school, today children are learning about solar power panels and reusable energy. The installation of solar panels on the school's roof not only saves energy, but also gives students a chance to learn more about green energy. At first, we decided to install solar panels in schools because they can help decrease the temperature in classrooms. Secondly, a school is a place where students come to learn and it is our job to pass on correct environmental concepts.
Currently, there are 24 schools in New Taipei City that have installed solar power panels, producing some 3 million watts yearly. Now, schools can not only reduce their carbon emissions, but also help their students understand the wonders of green energy. In Taiwan, paper carpets are traditionally used in memorial services to commemorate the deceased. However, used couplets have also become a major source of waste and air pollution. To prevent the problem from getting worse, Taichung City Mortuary Services Office introduced an e-couplet service to members of the public who can now commemorate the deceased while at the same time protect our environment. In Taiwan, mourners usually give paper couplets to remember those that have passed away. However, such traditional practices have become detrimental to our environment. After each memorial service, we collected piles of paper couplets. As they can't be recycled, we throw them away. Used paper couplets end up in incinerators and cause environmental pollution. Taichung's Chongde Funeral House last year burned over 26,000 couplets. A memorial service can generate dozens or even hundreds of couplets. It's quite horrifying if you calculate the amount annually. Sometimes, due to the space limitations, paper couplets are folded and hung up high, showing the names of givers instead of their words of tribute. Using paper couplets is not environmentally friendly. We need to think of a way to reduce our carbon emissions. At this memorial service, two large LCD monitors are showing couplets commemorating the deceased. Such electronic mediums have replaced traditional paper couplets here. The e-couplet is eco-friendly. Members of the public are also learning of its benefits. It's quite a useful practice. Using the e-couplet to pay their tribute to the deceased, members of the public can not only reduce the consumption of paper couplets, but also save their money. Citizens can connect to the website of the Mortuary Services Office of Taichung City to apply for our e complex service. It's free for all citizens. Citizens only need to register an account on the website. After filling in the names of the deceased and the date of the memorial service, they have various choices of e-couplets to choose from. The system will pick suitable selections based on the age and sex of the deceased. Each memorial service will have a designated number and family members can put that number on the obituary so that mourners can deliver their e-couplets accordingly. After our implementation of the e-couplet service, we have received mostly positive feedback. Many have felt that memorial services have become more dignified. Taichung's Chongde Funeral House implemented the e-couplet service in March and is expected to reduce waste by 12 tons. Later this year, Donghai and Dajia Funeral Houses will start similar practices as well. In the United States, the volunteers visited Dr. Edward Huang's house in Los Angeles to learn how to live a green lifestyle. But first, in Taiwan's Zhanghua County, we see how one city volunteer, Li Li Hu, gives unwanted items a second lease on life. In Zhanghua's Da Tun Township, city volunteer Li Li Hu regularly collects recyclables in his community. What is often seen by many as garbage are in fact treasures for this volunteer. If we turn the lid of this pot upside down, we can use it as a flower pot. Lee takes home chipped plates, bowls and cups and turns them into flower pots. The master said if we look at a cracked item from another angle, it will still look complete. This means we should look at one's good points instead of bad points. Putting his creativity to the test, Lee makes and matches different plants with different parts, giving these unwanted items a second lease on life. Recycling is about extending the lease on life of various items. If this item can be used for 20 years, it would be a waste if we threw it away after two to three years. Whenever there's a charity sale, Lee donates these plants to spread love to those in greater need. If we use a little creativity to fix up the items, we were going to throw away, we can give them away as a gift and thus form good affinity with others and help those in need. With a little creativity, one will be surprised at how easily garbage can be turned into gold. 
curates Dr. Edward Huang's house in Los Angeles of the United States, ventilation holes help adjust room temperature, while special ceramic tiles keep the house warm in cold weather. As a certified environmental inspector and green architect, Dr. Huang shares how to live a green lifestyle with city volunteers, Zichings and Cisals. Six uh, rain, rain barrel around the house. Uh, so not only save water because now I can use those rainwater for irrigation purpose. As Los Angeles enjoys beautiful sunshine all year round, the layout and French windows allow for abundant airflow throughout the house and help keep temperatures at comfortable levels. In the winter, all the leaves come down. The sunlight or sun heat can go directly into the house. As volunteers young and old learn of the many ways to live an eco-friendly lifestyle, the next step is to share these ideas with others and apply them to their own lives. Next, we meet a few creative young individuals in Taiwan who are helping to make a difference to the world they live in. One of them is a commercial director who collected second-hand digital cameras to give to disadvantaged children in Sichuan, China, and others are two female art teachers who taught children in Nepal the beauty of art. These photographs taken by children from remote Sichuan villages display their natural talent in capturing images and telling a story. And it's thanks to the commercial director Wu Zhaojun that audiences in Taiwan can enjoy such works of art. Two or three megapixel cameras aren't being used anymore, so we collected these cameras and gave them to the children to use. They can use these cameras to capture things like their village life or family. For these children, the second-hand cameras are treasures beyond belief. Seeing this, Wu is deeply moved. Before I left Sichuan, a child came up to me and asked if I thought he had a chance of being a photographer. At that moment, I knew what I am doing is making a difference in their lives. Wu is not the only one who is determined to make a difference in the lives of disadvantaged children. <laughs> Traveling to far-flung countries, two female Taiwanese art teachers are taking their art lessons on the road. Their first stop is Nepal. With the sky as their backdrop, these Nepalese children put their creativity to work by drawing colorful images accompanied by wise words. They made cards for the children of Taiwan, and this one means a man's greatness is not measured by his class, but by his heart. My friends know I'm doing this project, and they will save any extra materials from school for me, so I may share them with more children. Determined to make a difference in this world, the passion of these young Taiwanese are the future of Taiwan. We go to Hong Kong at the end of today's show while personally attending the International Film and TV Market Fair which Daya TV was invited to take part. The CEO, Tang Jemin, also seized the opportunity to join local volunteers in the morning study group to watch Master Zin Yin's Wisdom at Dong broadcast. We'll leave you with these images. Thank you for tuning in. Goodbye.